Now, Hari Srinivasan takes a broader look at the problems lower income Americans face when it comes to getting the money they need. South Dakota isn't the only place where payday loans are such a big problem. While a few states have banned or imposed strict regulations on these fringe lenders, they're ubiquitous in most of the country. In fact, there are more payday lending storefronts than there are Starbucks and McDonald's combined. In her book, How the Other Half Banks, Mersa Baradaran explores the booming industry providing financial services to the poor at exorbitant cost and offers some more equitable solutions. Thanks for joining us. So well, why, where is this gap uh, created? Why isn't there an incentive for all banks to reach out to all people with money? The gap is fairly new. So starting in the 1980s, a lot of community banks started shutting down branches in lower income areas, inner city neighborhoods, areas where their profit margins were lower than in other areas. And so part of it is it's, it's higher cost to lend to someone or to take a small deposit than it is to get a big deposit, right? Your, your overhead is the same whether you're you know taking in a hundred thousand dollars versus taking in five hundred dollars but your you know revenue off of that one hundred thousand dollars is much higher than it is off of that small deposit and so these banks started leaving these areas and part of it is that the government you know deregulatory forces allowed them to merge and form these huge conglomerates such as Bank of America so as these banks leave they leave this void for banking services and this is a void that quickly is filled by these fringe lenders so payday loans check cashing and when you go through certain cities just like there are food deserts where you don't have a grocery store it seems like there are almost bank deserts where it's populated primarily with these lenders that you're talking about how much money is there to be made it's an 89 billion dollar industry yearly and it doesn't seem that way so when you go into these neighborhoods these check cashers or payday lenders they seem like you know neighborhood um, joints, but they're really sort of multinational corporations. They're large, um, very profitable organizations, and they have this, what I call a facade of informality, right? So it seems as though, look, they speak your language, they're in your neighborhood, but really behind them there's a lot of bank financing. These are very sort of corporate big, mm -hmm. big firms. These companies are going to say, look, I'm taking a greater risk. This is a person that is not as credit worthy as someone who maybe walks into a Bank of America with a much larger amount of assets, right? So shouldn't I be able to charge a higher interest rate to get them this money fast? It is certainly a higher risk to lend to someone who is low income. However, there's a lot of studies to show that the price that they're actually charging isn't the cost of the loan. It's also fairly misleading when you compare it to the credit markets that the middle class and higher income have access to. And one of the big points of the book is, um, you know, even assuming that this is a market price that they're charging and it is the cost of credit because of the risks and the default, et cetera, um, the rest of us don't pay market prices for credit. The credit markets, whether it's for our mortgages, our student loans, any sort of bank credit you get is heavily subsidized by the federal government. The book is called How the Other Half Banks. Marissa Baradaran, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you.